Thanks. Antifa got violent in Washington and Charlottesville yesterday. The press tried to ignore it, but it happened. It's on tape. Mark Stein joins us after the break to discuss exactly what happened. Also, a lot going on over the last week, including news from the creepy porn lawyer. Things we missed when we were out of town. We'll revisit them after this. Yesterday was the year anniversary of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in which a woman was fatally struck by a car that was driven into the crowd. If you followed the hyperventilating press coverage leading up to yesterday's event, you probably expected to see thousands of hooded Klansmen showing up on horseback in D.C. to commemorate and celebrate the killing. White supremacy is just that prevalent in America, they tell us. It's everywhere. Except it's not. That's a lie. White supremacy is not ubiquitous in America. It's not a crisis. It's not even a meaningful category. It is incredibly rare. You could easily live your entire life in this country without meeting a single person who believes anything like that. Most of us have lived lives like that. I have. In fact, this is a generous, tolerant country. It always has been that. People who tell you otherwise are either delusional or trying to control you with fear, likely both. In the end yesterday, just a couple of dozen people showed up out of a country of 320 million people. They milled around for a while, got yelled at, and left. So much for the Klan rally. What is a crisis in America, and a growing crisis, is left-wing extremism and violence. Our elites abet and encourage it. Our media pretend it doesn't exist. Here, for example, was the scene yesterday in Washington. Antifa lunatics calling for the destruction of the United States of America. Watch. Benny Johnson of the Daily Caller took the time to interview some of the protesters. They freely confessed they would like to torture and kill the president. What would you do if Donald Trump showed up at the Trump? Murder him? I mean, yo, he's America's Caesar except he's a head. So, you gotta take him down. Trump! Trump! If it came down to it and it was a group effort, we'd have to do him like Gaddafi. If the president showed up this march, what would you do, sir? Beat his Beat his Meanwhile, in Charlottesville, protesters screamed at the cops. In D.C., they attacked police with bottles, fireworks, and eggs. Keep in mind, this is not the far right, it's the left. Cops on motorcycles were pushed as they tried to pass through the crowd. Back in Charlottesville, an NBC News reporter was assaulted by a screaming progressive. Watch this. Amazingly, and it is amazing, NBC News didn't even bother to cover the assault on its own staff. The left did it, so it would have undermined their storyline. Screaming leftists in black face masks throwing bottles and calling for the destruction of America and the murder of the president. You know how CNN described this group as, quote, anti-hate groups, because their hate isn't really hate. It's the opposite of hate, even if it's exactly the same as hate pretty amusingly Orwellian, but also scary, lying works over time, and that's exactly why they do it. Vox.com, in a rare fit of honesty, ran a piece entitled Antifa Clashes with Police and Journalists in Charlottesville and D.C. Well, that was too close to the truth for many on the left, and they complained. HuffPo, for example, did. Its hate and extremism reporter Christopher Mathias tweeted this, quote, this is a bad article and is a good example of how not to cover white supremacy a bad article. In other words, objective truth is bad when it obstructs the goal, which is gaining power. So lie or else, and most reporters do lie. But we don't have to lie. We can say what is obvious. The very people decrying fascism are the ones practicing fascism, crushing those who disagree with them, silencing contrary opinions, which they do constantly, threatening violence as they did yesterday. They can call it anti-hate all they want, but the truth is they would hurt you if they could. Mark Stein is an author and columnist. He guest hosted this program for three days last week and did a great job, and we're happy to have him back. So, Mark, you saw the video. Those, just so you know, those are anti-hate groups, the ones screaming right. and throwing things. Yeah, and actually uh, threatening to kill people and uh, 
wearing masks and in fact having, as you said, having all the attributes, not of anti-fascists, but of fascists. And I'm one of those people, uh, because when you look at them and you see like the little dweeby pajama boy types uh, uh, talking about wanting to kill people, and it's easy to laugh it off uh, and say, yeah, they, they don't really mean it, they're not into it. But in fact, when you look at what has been going on, the increase in the level of targeted intimidation of people who just happen to have a political disagreement with them, uh, I think we are approaching the point at which someone is going to get killed over this. And uh, the media will play a large part in that, because when they say uh, that thugs on the street intimidating not, not just political targets, but gen just general passing uh, uh, motor vehicle traffic, uh, the, the, the media like CNN, who call them anti-hate groups, are actually a big part of the problem here. The sentimentalization well, and, and glamorization of violence. Of course, but you can understand why the crowd is in a frenzy because they believe what they've been told, which is there is a massive white supremacist fascist movement on the verge of taking over. And I guess my question is, where are these people? I've lived in this country for 49 years. I'm not familiar with any large group that believes that. I never run into anyone who thinks that. I don't know a single person who believes that. This is a fantasy. Well, it's a lie. Why do the rest of us go along with it? And you're like, oh, yeah, it's a real problem. Really? Where? What well, are you talking about? Well, I'm totally confused. Well, you're, you're, you're wrong there, Tucker. There are 17 white supremacists in America. Uh, they're living in their parents' basement uh, because nothing makes you feel more supremacist than living in your parents' basement. Uh, and somehow the media has presented this as a, uh, a, a, as a nationwide phenomenon. But it's important to understand why they've done that. They've done that as part of a strategy to delegitimize people, not people who are white supremacists, but people who are ever so teensy-weensily right of center. Uh, exactly. So it's part That's of their exactly campaign right. to, to, to denormalize the Republican Party. And it's also, by the way, where restrictions on free speech are lead. So when you have all this denormalization and deplatforming at American colleges, where you say, oh, we can't have this guy come and speak to us uh, because he happens to believe that America should have uh, tighter immigration controls, you eventually end up with people who are incapable of making any argument and can only punch you in the face. Because the alternative to free speech is exactly. just to blow things up and smash uh, stuff. And that's what you see on the streets. It does seem like we're all kind of complicit in this, though. I mean, I, I never hear anybody say, wait, wait, I reject the premise of your argument. No. Everything you're saying is nuts. Nobody ever says no. it like, oh, yeah, well, it's too. No, no, it's like one side is absolutely bent on preventing me from saying what I think is true. And the other side's kind of passive. It's not parody. It's not even close from what I can tell. No, no, no. And I think that's where we, we don't push back on it hard enough. I mean, I think, I think frankly, you know, it's, it's, it's a seduction. Uh, when you have comedians, for example, standing up waving the severed head of a president, that comedian doesn't want to actually sever the head of the president. That's a bit too much hard work for her. But you can see she's <laughs> turned on by it. And there are other yeah. people who are turned on by it. And among all those people, maybe there is one who is sufficiently turned on by it. Uh, not necessarily, because you can't, it's hard to get close to the president. But you may run into, you know, the assistant deputy undersecretary of whatever from the White House that you happen to have seen on TV uh, when uh, she's in an Applebee's or a uh, 99's or whatever. And you might beat her up. I mean, that's actually, and Maxine Waters would encourage you to do that. So we have people yeah. who are essentially on the same continuum uh, as the Charlie Hebdo killers, where they think the answer to a dis those guys who killed the Charlie Hebdo, they were witty, amusing, intellectual people uh, killed by guys who don't know anything except how to kick the door down and kill you. And, uh, and that's actually, these guys in Antifa are the same thing. They can't make an argument. They're morons, but they're morons That's who right. have the scent of blood in their nostrils. When you give up on speech, you wind up with violence. That is exactly right. That's, That's right. a very deep point. Thank you. Mark Stein, we're going to see you again.